Hello everyone and welcome back to theCUBE's live three-day coverage of HPE Discover here in Las Vegas at the Venetian. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host and co-analyst, Dave Vellante. And we are welcoming Sherry Williams to the show. She is the SVP and General Manager, HPE GreenLake Flex, Flex Solutions and Common Solutions at HPE. Thank you so much. That's a long title, Sherry. It is a long title. <laughs> Big responsibility. <laughs> You've got a lot going on. A lot of work behind it. Exactly, exactly. So uh, private AI has been one of the many buzzwords of this HPE Discover. Uh, why don't you lay, lay, give the, our viewers the lay of the land. What does private AI mean in this context? Right, so as uh, for Discover, we announced private cloud AI which is a fully integrated hardware software stack, turnkey solution that includes, uh, uh, co-engineered with NVIDIA. It includes um, storage, compute, and networking. Of course, the compute is the NVIDIA GPUs, as well as a very rich curated stack of software components, including the NVIDIA NIM software stack, the NVIDIA AI Enterprise software stack, and the HPE AI Essential stack. So it comes completely preloaded, uh, racked and ready to roll into your data center, plug into your network, three clicks, and you're ready to go. So these are AI systems, not even just AI servers, is that right? They're systems, act exactly, engineered systems. Everything you need to run the stack is, is in the rack, ready to go, roll it in. It's interesting, it. Jensen in, in, in Antonio in the keynote, he kind of laid out, you know, he always brings something new when yes, he, he does. speaks. You know, he doesn't just parrot the same thing. I mean, he does say, you know, buy more and you'll save more. He does <laughs> yeah. say that a lot. But always brings a new angle. And this, the angle at, at Discover was, he said everybody has a stack, we have a stack too. And he talked about models, he talked about data, and he talked about compute. Mm -hmm. And if I understand it, that's essentially what you're building into the system, co-engineering with the, with the NIMS, well obviously with the GPU and the CUDA and all the software around it, so that it's ready. And it's not just, I wrote a piece this week on AI servers. I have to expand my, my, my observation space to AI systems. And that's really right. what you guys are doing, correct? Absolutely, it's a fully enge engineered system. So the, the models, you get that through the, the NVIDIA NIMS, right? The compute aspect, the GPUs, are fully you know, integrated in the system, and then storage is important, or the data is important, I should say. And you have the storage aspect, both uh, in system storage, and then we have uh, embedded in the system the Esmeral data fabric and the data lake house. And what's super important about that and super interesting is that that allows you through a single global namespace to be able to access data anywhere. It doesn't have to be on an HPE data source, uh, storage system. It can be on a com com competitive storage system. It can be in the public cloud. But it allows you to access data in different places, get it local to where you're actually trying to process it, um, and move it around. So that's, that's also a big differentiator that incredibly increases the productivity and the pace and time to value of, of actually realizing the value of your data in AI. So I can bring that compute to pretty much any data? Is that what, what you can bring the you... data to the compute. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? Okay. You can bring any, any of the data that you need to the compute. Okay. Um, I, I, I think I got it. And then, um, just one, one other follow up on, on Esmeral. Esmeral's bundled in to the system. It's bundled Comes in. with it. Comes with it. Okay, and, and the t-shirt sizes, I like to call them, it's like little GPUs, I mean all GPUs are big, but smaller all the way up to larger. Like what's inside, can you, can you so help us understand? So small and medium um, have L40S's. Large has H100 GPUs, and our extra large is based on Grace Hopper 200, GH200 GPUs. And small starts with you know, uh, four to eight uh, uh, GPUs, and then the other piece that's variable is the storage. So you can start with 30 terabytes of storage and go up to 109 terabytes on small, and then medium has you know, its own range and so forth. So you can actually, and they're tuned to different use cases and different models. So we've done the work for you already of what's the best, what's the best uh, best t-shirt size for inferencing, which is the best one for RAG. So we've taken that work out of it and allowed the customer then to, to identify what their use case is and 
uh, purchase that T-shirt size that's appropriate for that. And, and, and I presume you'll help them figure, okay, if I'm going to have this system, and, and, I'm on, and I want it to last for a while because you're going to bring new innovations mm. and, and I'm going to be able to upgrade non-disruptively, I think. Upgrade right? non-disruptively, yes. So you'll help the customer think through, well, I, I'm on this growth trajectory, so I might want to get, instead of getting a small, I might want to get a medium because I'll grow into it. Is that, is that a reasonable thing or would it be more, uh, no, start where, the, where you are today mm -hmm. and then, you know, as you grow, we can we can accommodate. How would you approach that? The beauty that of the sense? architecture is you can do either. You can start small, if you're not sure exactly what you want to do, you're not sure how much you need, you can start small and you can scale that system. Mm -hmm. Or you can start with a, something a little bit bigger than you might need and then grow within that system as you learn, you practice with models, you use models and you figure out what it is that you need to do. They're designed so that you can add capacity and you can upgrade as well. Another key part is on the software side is we have an evergreen model, so you're getting, the customer is getting regular software updates from both NVIDIA and HPE through regular lifecycle management of the system. So they don't have to go out and pull things down and look for stuff, it comes to the customer. So they and get I, the richness of the innovation that's happening with both companies. And I can scale the, the compute independent of the storage. Yes. Right? Yes. Like a dial up or dial yeah. Dialed down as I need to? Now, within parameters, so this is an important differentiation. Yeah, These are standard configurations, just like Jensen and Antonio talked about small, medium, large, extra large. When you go to McDonald's, for example, and you just check a medium, you can't actually add a bunch of extra things to it, right? These are pre designed so that the, 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 the customer does, and the salesperson doesn't have to spend a lot of time designing the hardware. They can focus on taking the use case, sizing it, aligning it with the different t-shirt sizes, and getting it deployed as quickly as possible. We, did a, we do a three quick deployment so that the real work and the real investment becomes on the, AI, on the software side with the AI stack. Take all the work out. We, it's not a reference architecture, right? And we have spoken with a variety of customers and um, partners that have used reference architectures to put these systems together. And it's taking them anywhere from six to 10 weeks to build these systems, get them up and running and fully functional, where it's a three, quick, a three click to deploy. So in theory, you're up and running in less than a day with the hardware side, and then you can just immediately focus on getting your data ready, getting access to your data, and getting straight into building your models, tuning your models, um, and so forth. And, and Jensen talks about we're on this one year, he actually used the term rhythm, on a yeah. one year rhythm. So that means you're going to be on a we're similar on rhythm. We're on a similar rhythm, okay, yes. So <laughs> as new things come out, Blackwells and Rubens and other stuff, you'll be able to so bring those in, and you said it would be non-disruptive. That we, it can be non-disruptive if that's what the customer chooses, is to do those sorts of upgrades. We are in lockstep with NVIDIA's roadmap, um, and uh, the compute roadmap in HPE's compute organization, right? So, um, so we're using everything that's coming in through the compute, goes into the system in lockstep. Would there be cases, that's interesting, you said if the customer chooses to do so, because I know the case I think of like ServiceNow, where they do a new release, and sometimes the customer says, I'm not ready for it. You know, I, I, I'll actually, let me plan the disruption. So you're saying the customer really has the choice there? Or? We give, give the customer choice, yeah. yeah. Okay. And they and they and they sometimes might prefer disruption. Uh, they may they may I, not necessarily <laughs> disruption. They prefer to to to, to plan is really exactly. Yes, so yes, exactly. They, okay. they might prefer to take a downtime or do it in a in a window that you know there's going to be fewer users on the system. So you know. Different customers have different models. Okay. Some just take the upgrades as they come in, and others would want to have more control yeah, over Yeah, because a happens. customer might say, I don't trust it. Take it down, right, during July 4th weekend. Yeah, right, yeah. we'll test it. We'll yes, even though, I, I believe you, HPE, non-disruptive, okay, fine, but <laughs> we're going to do it our way. Okay. Because we have a system, it works, you know, who knows, we have different industries. So we're getting that, right? Is yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that makes exactly, sense. Exactly. Give them the choice. Give them the choice. And a lot of customers are like, great, bring it on, you know, and so. Sherry, as, as, a, as a technology leader, and you've been a leader for some time now, I, and you also have a PhD, how yeah. do you think about 
employing the right strategies for innovation, particularly at this time, which is so disruptive in general with, with the introduction of Gen AI. How are you thinking about keeping your team ahead of the curve and are really championing their individual innovations as well as your team's strategy? That's such a good question. Um, I do have a PhD and um, when I was in academia, um, I was just leaving academia at the time that uh, molecular biology was really taking off and cloning the genome was just happening, right? And, and there were a lot of concerns then about, a lot of ethical concerns about what would happen with this technology or some of the things that could happen with the technology that would be detrimental to uh, mankind, right? And um, it's been so fun to kind of watch that grow and all the innovation and all the amazing things that have come out of that technology when you think about even just like COVID vaccines and stuff like that. It all has been evolving over the years from those initial, um, initial innovations. And so for me, it feels, this feels a little bit like that in the sense that there's all this incredible technology and we're all still trying to figure out what to do with it, right? You know, we talk to a lot of customers where they don't actually know exactly where to start. They know they want to do it. They know they have tons and tons and petabytes and petabytes of data that they'd like to tap into. They have automation and innovation they need to improve the efficiency of their, of their uh, companies and what they're doing but they're not exactly sure where to start. There's ethical concerns about how to use it. And it feels like, you know, five years from now, we're going to look back at this time and be like, oh my gosh, look at all the things that we've actually done with this technology and how we've made things better in the world and the workplace and our lives and so forth. And so I think there, it's, it's the creativity that you have to have and, and give the space for employees and people to really creatively think about the the art of the possible, the what ifs, like try it. And that's one of the things we want with private cloud AI is to, to get it into places like Equinix where customers can do trials and stuff so they can play around and, and just try it out. And you know, once you play a little bit, then you sometimes the light bulb goes off and you're like, oh my gosh, like what if I could do this? What if I could do that? And those what ifs is what actually drives the innovation that none of us have dreamed of yet. And then, like I said, five years from now, it's going to be amazing to figure out where we are and what we've accomplished with this technology. Speaking of dreams, <laughs> what, and I don't have a PhD in molecular biology, <laughs> but what if you fast forward 50 years right, uh, and, you th and you think about things like biological innovations and AI coming together, I mean, we, can, we know how to make sheep Right? <laughs> I mean, at some yes. point, we're going we're gonna to know how to make humans. Yeah. And they're going to be like really intelligent. I mean, it, it's, I think it's mind blowing to, it's actually scary to think about what's possible um, down the road. So I think it, it, it is, it is. And that's why I think sometimes we talk about governance and guardrails. Mm -hmm. We have governance and guardrails built into private cloud AI. I think it's super important that people in, industries, businesses, take, take the, very seriously the ethical concerns around AI and make sure that we're establishing guardrails, we have compliance in place to ensure that we're doing good with the technology and um, ensuring that it's used in the right way. Yeah, and, and you know, well, I, I didn't mean to throw fear, a fear blanket on, but because the flip side of it is when you listen to like futurists like a Ray Kurzweil, he makes a great point, he says, you know, as you use these tools that make you smarter, you don't ever want to go back. You don't ever say, I want to be dumber, right? And that's, <laughs> the same thing's going to happen with AI. It's going to make us smarter. Yeah, there'll be maybe some unintended consequences. You got to have guardrails and who, who knows what, what, that, what that evolves to, but nobody's going to want to be less smart. And we're, going, right. we're getting smarter and smarter, you know, by the week, by the month, by the year. Um, and we're going to live longer. We're going to live longer. Yeah. AI is going to help us live longer because and hopefully better and hopefully and healthier and better and all. There's a there's a ton of really interesting AI uh, work being done in medicine where now they're able to take data from multiple medical institutions, strip out the confidentiality parts, and put it all to together so that you get the power of many 
to look at things like cancer research in particular, mm -hmm. and you, where we weren't able to do that before, right? You, each institution had their own data in their own location. We can now move data into common locations and then take a, rather than one institution's data on, let's say, colon cancer research. Now you can take five or six, now you've got five times more customers, five times more data, many, many more than five times capability of actually finding cures and figuring out things that you would have only been able, you, you can't do with a smaller population of data. So the things that we can do that way, by putting, by moving data around, using uh, you know, data privacy capabilities to strip out things that you know, take, ensure privacy for the patients and, and all of us, but then you can take it and you'd have so much to train these models and learn things and it's going to drive incredible innovations. So coming back, dialing back from 50 years to five years to your, to your other point, five years, you said we're going to look back and say wow. And, and I do think that today in the enterprise, I often say we're hitting a lot of singles with AI. Yeah, it's yeah. nice, we're doing some chatty, uh, you know, applications and use cases and you know, it's helping, it's interesting, but it's not like solving the world's really hard problems. But organizations are, are working on those, and it just, it's just going to take longer. You know, pe sometimes you, people think, oh yeah, AI is just going to be magic and I'll get you know, instant <laughs> ROI. And you can get ROI on small projects, mm -hmm. but big projects are going to take a long time and investment and trial and error, but, but the outcomes, maybe they're going to take a while, but they, they're really going to be transformative in our they're society. They're going to be very transformative. And it will take, you know, there's, there's a lot of great uh, AI happening in, in HPC right now, and there's a lot of really great stuff there. Getting AI into the enterprise is going to drive a whole bunch of new innovations and capabilities that we haven't even imagined. And that's what uh, private cloud AI is really focused on the enterprise, not in the HPE space, right. but really in the enterprise where now you can get, you know, all enterprises have the ability to have this kind of capability at their fingertips and enable their employees to explore the art of the possible and see, again, I think five years from now, we're just going to, for some of it is going to be just feel like natural, of course, just like our phones. Of course you have a phone, right? Of course you have AI. Of course I can do AI on my phone, right? I mean, those are the kinds of things that happen when you have these kind of technologies and you make them available like PC AI, private cloud AI, you make it available to enterprises, all these kinds of interesting things emerge. Sherry, so. a pleasure having you on, a yeah. really inspirational conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm Rebecca Thanks. Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of HPE Discover. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.